Welcome to Ring the Alarm featuring Renee Cox and Shanique Smith. I'm Phyllis Hollis, the host and producer of a weekly podcast titled Cerebral Women Art Talks. It's a podcast curated to feature visual artists, mainly artists of color, female artists, art collectors, art professionals. There's more information on my website, cerebralwomen.com. Um, the discussion tonight is the third in a series leading up to a 2023 exhibition curated by Renee Cox for Guildhall. These talks tonight are very conversational. It's a conversation between colleagues, friends, acquaintances, totally unstructured and not rehearsed. And I'm sure you'll enjoy it very much. The first two talks were Renee in conversation with Derek Adams and Sanford Biggers, and they can both be found on the Guild Hall YouTube station. Um, the format of the talk tonight will include um, images of both artists' work, and that will follow with a 40 to 45 minute conversation and then a 10 to 15 minute chat. Uh, please, I'm sorry, 10 to 15 minute Q&A. Please put uh, your questions in the chat box. Um, before we begin, I do want to read a short bio of both the artists. Renee Cox was born in Colgate, Jamaica. She makes photographs, collage, and installations that draw on history, fashion, photography, and popular culture. She received her BA from Syracuse University and her MFA from the School of Visual Arts. She is an associate professor at Columbia University and has lectured at Yale College of Art, New York University, and Parsons School of Design, among others. She lives and works in Manhattan. To see her expanded bio, please visit her website, which is reneecox.org. The other artist tonight is Shanique Smith. She is based in Los Angeles. She's a painter, a sculpture, a performance artist known for her monumental abstractions of calligraphy, textile, and collage. Over the last 20 years, she has gleaned visual poetry from Vincent clothing and explored concepts of rituals through tying, writing, gestures inspired by her travels and her early graffiti roots in Baltimore. Uh, she has exhibited in over 20 solo presentations and many prestigious institutions, and she is collected also in many prestigious collections. Uh, in 2020, Shanique was awarded a Tufts Alumni Travel Fellowship, and she has also received awards from Joan Mitchell Foundation, Tiffany Foundation, among others. Um, please read more about her at her website, shaniquesmith.com. Thank you very much. Enjoy. So here we go. We're going through the slides. This is just Oh, good evening, people. Um, I just want to say <laughs> I'm just showing you um, some new work. I mean, literally, like from last week. And uh, but this is not about me. It's about Shanique. So I just wanted to do this very quickly with my own work. But I've been experimenting with tin types and other methods, especially during this pandemic, and also gender switching, changing, as in this photograph. And just basically having uh, fun with the uh, photography. So, Shanique, the bundle. Hi. The bundles. How are you, girl? Good. Can you hear me okay? I hear you uh, loud and oh. clear. Okay. Well, here's like a little brief overview of my last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, right. <laughs> this is a rather time. Nope. We met way before this. Yeah. Um, met this in is... the 90s. Yep. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I totally forgot that. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Because <laughs> we not... ageless. We ageless. We're Age ageless. Is... Yes. Let, not I, won't hold up, I won't hold up the, the slides, but... Uh, I have I... to say something about the bundles, because... At first, when I saw the bundles, it, it made me sort of feel uh, a little uh, SNME. <laughs> you know, this uh, the tying up, and also the thing that uh, what is it the Japanese do in terms of uh, tying 
the women oh, up yeah. huh what is it called i can't pronounce it right Definitely. neither can i <laughs> but it's this thing where they tie the women up and they use it special right. well, with, with with this special rope and whatnot well with this performance piece i was applying the same gesture that i was to sculptures that i was making at the time um where i'm bundling belongings you know we package a lot of things we don't just tie each other ourselves up or each other up for for sexual pleasure or desire um no 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 but to my but, second, but that was my first but, like, <laughs> point but my second point and i'll be really quick i was out in la a couple of weeks ago doing a job and the <laughs> amount of homeless people that i saw right okay so now having seen all those homeless people in, in los angeles now these bundles resonate differently for me now That's right what well okay so okay bondage homelessness i get it um those two things they have reference they have connection but you know i started doing these things because i saw how you know we create these rituals to tie up recycling we mm -hmm. find things that we're carrying in nomadic cultures people who are experiencing homelessness um not by choice and people who are nomads by choice bundle their things we've been bundling it's like an old way of doing things <laughs> it, yeah. and it's ritualistic so with this performance i was applying the same gesture of my sculptures onto my body um to see what would happen not knowing what it would be like at the end right um, and not knowing what things are going to be like at the end is kind of one of the things that is pervasive throughout all the works that i make these are Pals. from a series of sculptures um, that are referencing bales that um, of, where clothes get shipped overseas, bales of cotton, things like that, of all hand tied. Um, mm -hmm. On the right is, on the left is uh, all found black, different mm. types, you know, from velvet to silk to brocade, um, beaded embroidered on the right is one where I started dying and writing. Um, I had a bunch of um, friends, people close to me come in and, and script some of the cloth with prayers, wishes, oh. things like that. And then they're contained. Um, Nick, you and can keep using the indigo. Yes. Yes. In varying shades. Right. Um, I didn't dye the white. Um, this is also not dyed. This is all found color and exercise. The first few of these that I did, I guess I started with white um, in about in like 2005 um, and made some wall pieces and, and bales and, you know, that were kind of after like my own nod to Ryman. And then I made one that was after Ellsworth Kelly. Um, this is more recent one. That's all, you know, the dimensions are for me. Right. Where you see the drips that you see are ribbons and like ties from hoodies and sleeves and things like that. Mm. Um, so it's kind of imperfect minimalism. Right, color study. Maximum minimalism. And so, you know, uh, anybody who knows my work knows that I wrote graffiti as a kid and took courses in Japanese calligraphy. So those, um, mm calligraphic marks and drawing and dance inform my hand. Um, everything is constantly in motion. I use geometry um, sometimes. I was gonna say, this has the sacred geometry going on here. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's up underneath everything mm -hmm. else and you don't see it. And sometimes it's more overt. The, this piece is kind of a self-portrait um, where all those, all the, design is from show cards from all the solo mm. shows I had had up until that point that I was recycling uh -huh. in, in chronology from the center out. All right. And uh, I've been cutting things out, you know, I guess um, I cut paper, I take, you know, recycle bits of my work. And then I started to cut these, this is out of wood and collage in the center and um, painted on the outside. And it, there sh we should have a, de I didn't do a detail of the black that it's like written in black. That piece was very much mm. about bl 
Black Lives Matter um, uh, the time. Interesting in terms of representation. Yeah, well, it's text. Mm -hmm. um, that's the thing about the, you know, the calligraphy. It, I think the it, calligraphy just it gives it motion and it, it sort of it ties it all to, together. Yeah, I mean, the, this there's always been a line holding things together in my work. Mm -hmm. And um, even before I started working abstractly and uh, writing, you know, using words is a, is a vehicle towards me expressing myself. And, you know, I nice. use my whole body to, to create these gestures and different types of brushes and things like that. And, um, you know, it's also a lot like the way the ribbon moves to hold fabric clothing together. And you know, the fabric and clothing comes from people I know. And there's like a misconception that I like go around scrounging to find things on the street and put it together. Ew, no. <laughs> no, but I think I think the word street is like something that comes up right. because I'm a black woman doing it. Um, so these are more recent, uh, I guess I'm allowing the gesture to be more of a focus or even more present. They're almost like talismans, this series of work that I made. Um, yeah, I like the black, that black stroke is super strong there. Yeah, and I started making my own black. Mm. Um, mm. Making my own inks. I've been looking in, you know, like experimenting with natural dyes, but it's hard when you mix different types of fabric. Right. Um, and uh, now this was the this piece is, that I saw the breathing room that was that moved me. We're going to see yeah. a little clip of that coming up. Right. So. Okay. So yeah. So this performance um, I performed in January 2020. I, you know, you saw the first images of me uh, bundling myself. That was performed in my studio. I've never performed any kind of ritualistic gesture like that in public. Um, I, I first did this piece in 2018 and then um, expanded it, evolved it um, early 2020 at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, the three women are different uh, yoginis, yoga instructors, because we're performing, I asked them to perform different types of breathing and um, they could perform the breaths and they are mic'd so that the room is permeated with breath, with breathing.
I love that video. I mean, when I saw it, I think I called you like pretty soon after that as well. I think so. Yeah. Time moves funny, so I'm not. Right. I recall. But I'm saying I was like really taken by that. I mean, the whole breath and um, the reveal at the end, and it had this um, sort of a mono. What is it like? I want to the word you would associate with monks and the hermit and the binding of yourself and then the release of that and the freedom of that. I was just like, wow, this is next level. This is why I'm talking with you because you get me. You get me, Renee. You feel yeah. everything that I'm trying to put out there. You know, um, it's a bunch of things happening at once that are coming in into the room and what we shared were some clips of a, I guess almost 28 minute performance. So I'm bundled for a long time. I essentially leave the room right, I, and become a sort of object in space The, you know, I guess the, you know, and these are new things. Um, mm -hmm. And the more you do these things, the more you understand and I know that I wanted to create uh, an experience for the viewers that were present and for myself of transformation and right. to embody and, you know, take all the, this kind of pain that was floating in the air and um, still continues <laughs> to... Right. Um, and, and transform it. Like, you know, we, when we were talking about bondage earlier, there's this other thing of cocooning. Right. You know? So it's kind of cocooning and emerging as something different. Mm -hmm. um, like and I think, a, yeah, yeah. 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 Which is, I mean, for me, it's just like a soul that's been um, matured and it then releases and goes on to this next sort of uh, dimension of uh, life. And the and breath is so like important that. behind, I mean, without the breath, I mean, you know, you're dead. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. Breath is so important. Yeah. And I, I've been using it um, in different ways in my work since grad school. Mm -hmm. um, at first I was sampling my breath, you know, um, working with like friends that are musicians to sample my breath and create like kind of a beat and different types of music uh, out of it and right. then dan dance to it. Um, I've done some collaborations with dancers where that the mu I made the music and the costumes and the breath was always part of it. Um, so, but not performed live like that. I mean, I did a collaboration with my dancer friend, Marissa, and she and I performed together and I, my movements were more constricted and I did some breathing in that, but there mm -hmm. was music overlap, you know, like on top of it. It wasn't like this. Right. No, this one for me was very, it was very powerful because it was the symmetry of it and also the tonality of it as well. The, the gray with the white sort of streaks going through, reminding me of your marks. Yeah. And they were bleach, bleached in, batiked yeah, in. Exactly. So it had that, it, it was totally um, formed, totally, for me, it was like the culmination of like all the years of work successfully put into this now that you told me 28 minute long performance and in this time frame that we're living in where people are so disconnected from self mm. and from their breath because mm. most people don't really breathe properly right their breaths are very short um it just kind of reinforced for me where we as a society need to be going and moving in that direction of whatever the fifth dimension 
-hmm. that is supposedly upon us now. Yeah. And to take that step back, to take that step out of ourselves, to go inward, but then to be able to come out. Right. And then that video for me just, it was like a sharing. Right. Of of what, what needs to happen right now in our society. So I was, uh, I was really impressed when I saw it say that. Thank you, Renee. Yeah. Thank you. And you know, I just don't say those things just like that. It was oh, like, no. <laughs> I was like, wow. Yeah. Well, and it means a lot um, for it to be experienced and seen that way because, um, you know, concepts of spirituality, um, of evolution, and meditation, things like that were things that I started working with in grad school and was completely, you know, trashed. <laughs> not, not trashed, I, maybe that's too harsh, critiqued. Right. Well, no, I'm sure you were trashed. Harshly for, yes. Yeah. yeah. Most you're of the people you're talk talking to, they have, they're not conscious. There's a level well, of consciousness that's required. Well, there's some right. argument to, to the idea that all art is spiritual in some mm-hmm. way. Right. Um, but well, for me, I use it as a tool for me. Right. And hopefully, when the viewer experiences the work, they feel something like an exchange between me and them and maybe awaken something within them. You know, um, people either, you know, either get it or they don't. And that, you know, that's fine too. But right. And you know who they are. Later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm saying, it's like, I go like, okay, if you don't get it, okay, I know who you are. I know. <laughs> That you know, I F Y for K Y. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> it's true. But you know, with and because but because of you know that that criticism, um, I have these on so that I can block some of the computer light. I've been on my phone way too much right. <laughs> and <laughs> looking at screens way too much. Um, but it's it's weird to have a layer. Um, the cool. criticism like the lenses. <laughs> yeah they're, they have a, like an amber yeah um but that criticism you know also pushed me in the direction of not trying to talk about my work through that right that lens so i refocused on the process and form and material aspects of the work and the connections that those held, mm. you know, with fabric and cloth and, and how they might actually also connect to any kind of, to my, you know, thoughts on consciousness or. Right. And, and I'm, so for that, it's good because it gave me, you know, different levels of depth and that was successful. So good, right. jo- good job guys. <laughs> <laughs> even though it, even though it kind of broke me. <laughs> at well, the time. no, not really, because you've come out triumphant on the other end, and True. now times have changed, and people at the time, huh? At right. the time, it was right. No, I'm sure at the time they were like, "Oh, wow, like this is some hippy dippy, like oh, like, right. where is she coming from?" And you're you're uh, the only black woman in your program, mm-hmm. and and these are all white men telling you this, and also telling you that you know, okay, the heroic gesture of abstraction is dead. Uh, that's what I love it when people tell me that. Because I don't, you know, I, I think that black women need to experience as much heroism and that kind of bravado and expression within ourselves as we can. And, and this is my way of, of stepping into that. Right. No, I mean, as we definitely should. So, I mean, that is, that's so basically what you're saying too also too that's how you're representing black women and within right. those marks within those gestures so i i i think so i haven't always spelled it out like that i didn't need know i needed to mm-hmm. um you don't but well yeah no, i'm saying you don't i mean is this because like we're in conversation but i mean yeah i think uh a lot of times, um, 
less is best. Well, I want I want people to figure it out for themselves. You know, right? That's what I'm saying. So, but that sometimes within that, I've obscured like what I'm really meaning to say. Like, right. So there's there's like a balance between what how much you share and how much you don't, and what kills the mystery and what doesn't what enhances it. Right. That's a, that's a dance. But it was also too for me. It was about the. I mean, even though we're looking at it after the fact on the video, but it was very much about present moment awareness as far as I was concerned, because I feel like that's where we need to be at this point. Like, I hate when people are always trying to project you out into the future. Yeah, mm. when people like, I hate that question when people like say, oh, so what are you working on next? And I'm like, holy shit, like, wait a minute, is this not enough? <laughs> <laughs> what are you worried about the next thing for? You know, can we just be yeah. in this moment right Wait, now? Wait, how about where do you see yourself in five years? <sighs> not with you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Not with that person who asked that question. <laughs> uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, that's true. Five years, what would that be? 2026. Yeah. I have no idea. I mean, for me, it's about uh, it's the day to day. It's enjoy yeah. this. It's it's about enjoying this moment right now, you know. As far as I'm, yeah. I go like this is the only moment we have. This is the moment, so we have to enjoy this moment, not what's going to happen tomorrow or next right. week. Oh, then totally. that leaves you a little bit empty, I feel. But the way that society has presented yeah. itself to us, it's always about projecting out into the future. And for me, I say that's part of the whole capitalist thing, like where they can start this out selling you stuff, <laughs> which your work speaks to as well in terms of consumerism and mm -hmm. the, the waste also, mm -hmm. and how you are able to recycle or re-embrace the mm -hmm. materials that you use. And I mean, I've heard you speak about that to they're, you know, ephemeral. And then it's like taking those pieces and then putting them back together in another configuration for another piece. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's that. Yeah, that's one of my attractions to it. But, mm -hmm. but it's also like this odd connection that we have with fabric, you know, that I think we take it for granted. Well, one, we take everything for granted. <laughs> mm. People take shoes and socks for granted, and you know our basic belongings and what we have. It's so the what we have and what we don't. How we how we identify ourselves through clothing that that's intriguing, but it's also intriguing like this history of cloth, mm. you know, and how it how it connected cultures and how it still connects cultures. Right. You know, even though now it's a more a more gluttonous, you know, overconsumptive sort of terms, it's mm -hmm. still like this like kind of thread. Even our language, you know, it all of it, cloth is one of the first art, artifacts that humans made, and mm. because of it, it's interwoven throughout our language and how we see, you know, time, space. Right. Costume, yeah, um, you know, representation. I mean, I've been thinking about recently, like you know, through uh, colonization, the whole human zoos that uh, human zoos. Yeah, that you know. I mean, it, that's some sick shit. <laughs> I, I didn't invent it. <laughs> I know, but God, you know, and that remind um, oh, that reminds me of um. We know them. Yeah, they're the artists, all around us. That, no, but no, the artist that that um. Oh, um, oh wait, Coco Fusco. Coco. Coco and, and the the guy, the Palermo. No. Yeah, he has a. Oh God, just uh, right. You know, I know it's exactly. On top of my brain. Yeah. Exit art. Yes, exactly, exactly. <sighs> His name is Escape, but Coco Fusco was part of it. So if anybody's looking yes. it up, it was a. Uh, Thank you. I said Guillermo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Guillermo Gomez Pena. 
and Coco Fus Fusco made this beautiful piece. Well, right. beautiful. That's right, and that was it was a reference to I mean, the human zoos. I think was it a reference to Atabanga? Atabanga was the uh, the guy that they had it at the Bronx Zoo with yeah. the chimpanzees. And so they were in a cage. Yeah, Atabanga was in a cage. No, but I'm talking about the No, they were, yeah, no, they were in a cage too. And where was that presented? Do you remember? But you anyway, know, you know, right. I know. It was at X and Art. So, is it? Anyway. I don't know. That was a powerful piece that, yeah. that you know, needs to be brought up again now, especially with children being held in cages. Hello. <laughs> And like that. <laughs> I mean, exactly. I mean, people don't learn, I guess, the uh, the horror behind that. The horror. Yeah. The un, you know, the people who claim to be most Christian. Well, and the people who claim to be the most civilized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where I go. The no. most barbaric. So barbaric. The no. Things. I said, how can you be civilized? You draw, know. I'm getting chills on people. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting I, chills. Uh, Let me, let's, let's, I'm going to have to get up and get a little cocktail if we keep down that path. Let's <laughs> segue. <laughs> oh, okay, so switch it up. I don't, how did we get there anyway? Just it's my that. fault. You mentioned human zoos. I know, but no, because we were talking about fabric and then I got, to, I was thinking about <laughs> costume. And I was oh. thinking about the, the spectacle that mm. the human zoos were meant to perpetuate in order to um, justify colonization in various parts of the world and whatnot. That's, right. that's how I was, that's how my mind was working. It was anthropology. Yeah, exactly. But we're gonna bring these people over to Europe and to the United States. Cause I think one of the biggest ones was in St. Louis doing like a world fair. fair world fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just that notion of like, okay let's get all of their costumes supposedly which was not necessarily costume it's what they wore. And, right. and, 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 and for some of them only on certain occasions because some of them were like, you know teachers and <laughs> like regular people and then they basically trick them into going to Europe and the United States to be the savages. So that it could show the others what it was like. And so that's how I right. got the fabric thing. Well, and it's it's not just to show others what what they're what's it's like in the world, but it's also to show how powerful one is and how much more superior one is to the rest of, of oh, the yeah, world no, or humanity. Like racism, white supremacy, totally. <laughs> And right. we're here to take all your minerals from your country. <laughs> right. You know? One one huge example of that, um, one of the like five books I'm listening to off and on <laughs> is Graham Hancock's um, America Before. Mm. You know, and, and archaeology has been so um, limited by early archaeologists and their racism mm -hmm. and white supremacy. Um, that for centuries, people believed that there were no early people here. Right. That there were no, like, like they, they couldn't fathom that there was an advanced society here in America prior to taking this land. Right. And any, oh. any kind of evidence of it has been suppressed or hidden. Or, until or eradicated. Right, exactly, oh. exactly. Yeah. But but there there are these different um, sites that have been uncovered, and over you know over the last twenty years, it's like undeniable. Um, right. I don't, I totally recommend it. But yeah, there's something I read. I mean, a while ago. I mean, where Verrazano, okay, the explorer, in his diaries when he got here, he basically New York Harbor, right, in like 1400s. He wrote that he was greeted by some black kinky haired people. So one has to say, well, wait, that doesn't, that's not the description of the Native American. So <laughs> who are they? <laughs> yeah. 
So, and I just- Maybe it was the Vikings. (laughs) (laughs) They get what they came in, but they were more north, I think, like around Nova Scotia, Northern Canada. I'm kidding. Yeah. (laughs) No, but to my my point was just simply that, you know, if the cradle of civilization is Africa, uh, obviously Black folks, people of color have been traveling around the world for freaking eons. Well, but then even that theory is in dispute because people have, people develop in different places. Mm -hmm. Like in in Micronesia, Melanesia, South Pacific. Um, There's just this like, there hasn't been evidence of open ocean travel that people were capable of it. Yet there's a DNA strand in the middle of the Amazons that comes from the South Pacific. And it could only have gotten there Mm -hmm. if people came there. Right, so traveling. Anyway, I mean, they they just don't know until they know. And and that's what science is. Science is about discovery, (laughs) constant discovery, testing, research, but there, you know, people don't want to research certain areas because it unravels theories that they want to hold concrete. Well, yeah, that messes with their business, so mm-hmm. to speak, <laughs> with their revenue, with their money. Yeah. In terms of presenting. And, and, and superiority. Uh, yeah. So it all I mean, comes. it's fascinating. And, you know, you mentioned, we were talking about the chrysalis of a butterfly, mm-hmm. you know, me bundling and reemerging. Right. And um, you know the the bundles and the paintings they they kind of reference each other back and forth. There's this right. push pull of bound energy and expressed energy, like the potential and the unraveling mm. of that strand. Um, and uh, I've been listening to another book about butterflies. What I didn't know is that butterflies were like are millions of years old. Mm-hmm like 75 million years old is the oldest recorded like fossil of a, of a butterfly. Mm. And, and people thought that they only drank nectar, but they found different moths and things that they, they survive on blood, they can survive on, you know, all kinds of right. feeding. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like butterflies must be like freaking hardcore. Insects have been here longer than anything. and. And they'll be there long after we're gone. (laughs) Right. And and the butterfly, you know, and as unique as it is for how it transforms, you know, is ancient and Mm -hmm. survived the dinosaurs and ice ages. Right. And things like that. So I mentioned butterflies and they're in my work and stuff like that. But I've had other people like say, oh, you know, that kind of conversation about joy and butterflies and all that, you know, that lacks rigor. Oh, fuck that. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck that. (laughs) I am like, no, I am all about- I really hate that word rigor because it sounds like rigor mortis. Exactly. (laughs) I'm about black joy because it's like, why the hell would we not be enjoying ourselves when we have the opportunity to be doing that. Well, and I for mean, me too, unlike, there's a difference between joy and fun. No, no, joy is is here for me. Joy is something that you come to after you've gone through things yeah. and you love, it's like a love light. The passion. Where you transform darkness into right. joy. Yes. It's not just having fun and frivolity. Fun is but, superficial. Right. But, I mean, on some levels. Right. So yeah. it's just interesting. I, it's also, you brought up, um, you know, when I was talking about my expression and my bravado as a Black woman and my energy and my spirit, you know, putting it out on the canvas, my whole body reaching out. Yeah. Um, I had someone recently email me about how, you know, my work doesn't deal with Black identity. And I'm like, well, you know, it doesn't in that sense. I'm not illustrating that or depicting 
blackness, mm. but there is an argument for an expansive view of what that is and can it keep transforming as we go? And can I, like as a black woman and me putting out in the world, is that not also black exactly. in its own way, even though it's talking about spirituality or, right. and not the church per se? Right, well, that's not spiritual. Well, I mean, it, it's whatever you make of, you know, everything. Well, I, just, I say that because whatever religion you make is man-made. Religion is man-made. Spirituality has been around as you Religion say, is man-made, but the way, that, um, the way that individuals, you know, interact with it can be spiritual. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe if they take it there. But I'm saying for me, religion, right. is, it just becomes, it's a man-made thing, made to control people with you know rules and this and that and right well some of it well, i mean well, there's, I so I there's catholicism because that's right. where they tried to put me i mean they're like okay you're catholic oh we were talking about this exactly and i we went to catholic school when i was a kid but mainly because it was the most progressive kind of private school that um my mom could get me into um oh, yeah. because some of them said that they their quotas for black children were full, you know. <laughs> okay. And and so I went to a private a parochial school, Catholic school. I enjoyed, you know, like the stages of the mm -hmm. cross that they had. They had this beautiful courtyard mm -hmm. of these statues like sitting around. And it was like a sacred site. Right. Like like they do monoliths in a stone circle. That's the way I saw it. But when it came to, they showed us a film. I remember this in like second grade or third grade that animals don't have souls. It's like this like little boy and girl had a like, dove and it died wow. and their parents told them it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> I yeah. was like, fuck that. That's <laughs> not true. And, and then my mom gave me some, what's it? A book, it's called The Cat Who Went to Heaven. Mm. It's a children's story about Buddha and how all the animals came. Right. Um, it's a really cute children's story. Anyway, there's some truth in everything, you know? Oh, like no, I went cute. to Catholic school and my, I went to Methodist church with my grandparents and I sang in the choir when I was little and I like to wear the robes. Right. That was fun. Uh -huh. We talked about the body and blood of Christ. I yeah. remember you now, you, you were saying, what, what did you say about that when you were a kid? I said, well, I was in the fourth grade and uh, I thought it was rather primitive that uh, I was going through the Holy Communion thing. So I thought it was pretty primitive that they wanted me to eat the body of Christ, which was this nasty little uh, wafer from Secaucus, New Jersey, actually, they make them there. And I had to put it you on. You love my saying that it's from Sakak. <laughs> I know because it's like so, like, uh, like it has nothing to do with anything. And you have to put it on your tongue, and then you have to wait for it to melt, like because you can't chew it because right. that would mean that you were chewing Christ. Okay, right. that sounded ludicrous to me even at nine years old. Right. And then the second part was okay. Here's the chalice. Here's the wine. And we're going to pass it down the line of everybody taking a sip at the same cup, which also at nine years old seemed really nasty to me as well. So <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and then I said to him, I said, wait, isn't this like cannibals or something? Like, isn't it what cannibals do? And I don't, Papa New Guinea, uh, we're eating his body and then we're drinking his blood as well. This is not cool. It and freaked you out. It freaked you, out. it freaked you out. It freaked you out. I thought it was backward. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's different. Um, I mean, it, I, was, I, I, I thought it was, you know, it's like pagan. They said, okay, we're, we're not pagans. Yet well, it is pagan. Yeah, it's totally I pagan. mean, well, I mean, there are bits and pieces from different right. cultures wrapped into Christianity. Um, but, you know, after Catholic school, I went to a predominantly Jewish um, private school. We moved. And I got um, into this really great school. Madeline Lingle, do you know that writer? Mm -mm. No. She wrote the book, A Wrinkle in Time. Oh, wait, I mean, I've heard of it, but yes, no, I've never. I, let's not discuss the movie, it was not my favorite. 
Okay. Um, but that book series was <laughs> really great. And she came to our school, you know, and did readings. It was such a, it was one of those schools. Uh -huh. I went to, I went to like 11 different schools, something like that. All in Maryland or you were moving? Yeah. Around? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. No, eight. Let's, I went to eight schools before I graduated high school. Wow. I moved around to get the, because some, you know, like Catholic school didn't believe in accelerated learning. Mm -hmm. And my mom could tell I was bored. So we went to another school. When I went to this other school, they skipped me a grade. Right. Okay. So anyway, sorry. We, we went down the, we went down the education rabbit hole. Um, somehow we got onto Catholicism. I don't know what happened. Right. Um. <laughs> oh, I meant, oh, I was talking about butterflies right. and rigor. And, and then I said, um, something about animals not going to yeah but you said that they told you that animals don't go to heaven because because they don't have the soul right. i went off on a tangent right. which is crazy because i mean obviously they do and animals give you that unconditional love well i should say let's say your dogs and your cats anyway because right they're well so domesticated <laughs> oh yeah. my, let's so not talk about my this, cat like, let me ask you this question. Um, what artist would you say that uh, had a, uh, a real impact, uh, not only maybe about your practice or even just how you yeah. respond to things? I mean, I can tell you yeah. mine, in terms of um, speaking and presenting, it was Faith Ringgold because mm. Faith just, I saw her at Cornell and she yeah. spoke from the heart and she had the story behind the piece. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's how I'm going to do it too. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to, you know, give some sort of art speak because I can't. And I mean, like I've said many times before, when I was at the Whitney program, I, I barely understood what these people were talking about. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I've got to do it from here. So right, I, right. it was one for me. And who's yours? Oh, I don't know if there's just one. Um, in person, Joyce Scott came to our school when I was in high school mm -hmm. as, a, as a visiting artist. And because um, I grew up in Baltimore and she's Baltimore. Right. Um, so you knew from. I just, I, there are a lot of artists that have. You know, like meeting you in the 90s was a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, the work that you, I was just talking about it last night, the work that you made that was up at the Brooklyn Museum and how Giuliani was like peeing in his pants because, <laughs> you know, and then, so that was a big deal. You know what, um, Keith Haring. Mm, right. Um, you know, a kid in the 80s visiting New York, getting to see, him. Um, yeah, I met him like just unfortunately, like I think maybe two months, three months before he died. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I, the art that was around me, you know, I wasn't like, I had, we had posters of Romare Bearden in the house and my grandma, you know, when we were all living together when I was really little, she just thought he was the artist you know, um, so that was an influence. And my mom um, was befriended by Erte when she was in FIT in Paris. Uh -huh. um, who, do you know his work? It's he's like, doing it's doing like fashion design, design and... Exactly. Yeah, he's doing like illustrations. <laughs> yeah, that work really affected me. And, you know, I love Barbara Chase for Boo, all the artists that I'm friends with, you know, as we come up together, Kehinde, McLean, Derek, you know, all the people that you have talked to and Joan Mitchell. Right. Joan. Right. I mean, I could even say, I mean, Chalk Close, which I guess some people would be like, eh, but I mean, I never, no, just I just, I know, I never had an issue with him, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> 
Yeah. And he was very generous, you know what I'm saying? And in terms yeah. of introductions and, <laughs> and that kind of thing. So I mean- Rauschenberg. Okay. Nary Ward. Huge. Oh, God. Nary, yeah. Nary. He's yeah. A, one of my mentors. Me. Yeah, Nary. Scohegan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could see that. I could see your correlation. Nary, even uh, what's his name? Uh, Leonardo Drew. I didn't know Leo's work until much, you know, when we were showing together, like right. in group shows together. Radcliffe. Bailey. Right. right. There's a lot. Right. So let me, you knew for- Betty Sarr. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Name her. Sorry, I'm going down my Rolodex in my head. Right. But what I was going to say before we name everybody. <laughs> I know. Shout from... out to all, <laughs> all the homies. <laughs> but you knew as a kid is yeah. what I'm extrapolating here that you wanted to be an artist from then. I did, although I, I studied dance and I had some ideas of doing that. Um, when I went to high school for the arts, I was a visual arts major. So when I was 13, mm -hmm. I guess, I was working towards that uh, Shani, tradition. Can I ask you a question from the audience? Um, oh. I don't know, is Renee done talking? Is it, is it that time yet, Phyllis? It is. Okay. <laughs> he has instructions to come in when the time is run out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we could talk all night. Well, yeah. I have a question. I just have a question. I a see question. a couple questions exactly. in the queue. Okay. So I have them up here. So um, I'll read the first one. From Almond. Yes. Uh, can you talk about the idea of joy and beauty in your work and how you see that fitting into the discourse of the art world today. And if you see a place and earnest exploration of those things within the art world. Okay. This is a two part, huge question. Okay. <laughs> um, fitting into the discourse of art world today. Um, yes. Yeah. How do I see it fitting in? Um, I, uh, do you mean like art historically or do you mean like the market or, I'm not sure. I don't know if I fit in. And in that sense, I don't know if I want to fit in. I, I guess I fit within a group of people who are working within abstraction. Um, I have, you know, there's a lineage that the work is linked to of black abstract painters and, and just abstraction in general. Um, and if I see a place for earnest exploration of those things within the art world, mm. well, I don't know. Is there a place, you tell me, Almond. Is, <laughs> I mean, these are the kinds of questions mm. that I don't, you know, I'm sitting in my studio. I don't bring those questions into the studio because I don't try to figure out where I fit when I'm working and making things. I won't, you know, I can't say that I don't contemplate that sometimes as, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm bombarded on social media and, and different, you know, websites and things about who are trying to predict where the art world is going and what's hot, top 10 this and now kind of thing. Um, within that, I don't know where I fit. I, I guess I'm in the I'm in a transitional phase too. I'm mid career, and as as a black female artist, a mid career artist, that's a different place. Um, and the art world goes in these cycles of recognizing what's young and new, and then what's old and and needs to be rediscovered. And so, I don't know. You tell me. Did I answer that question? Phyllis, well, she did me. comment. She said, I mean, is there a place for earnestness, exploration of joy and beauty? Sure. Yeah. Wherever you created. Yeah, there has to be. There oh. is. I would say that, you know, a good, 
maybe I'm being generous, 40% of the art out there is earnest and concerned with joy and beauty mm -hmm. and exploration. But not all art is involved with exploration. Right. Uh, so I'm not sure. I like those questions, though. We have another one for you. <laughs> this person is asking or stating that you're- An anonymous attendee? Yes, yes, yes. They're, they're saying, so you create in many mediums, performance, sculpture, painting, large scale, public artworks. Have you ever considered the stage? Have you worked in theater as in traditional performance spaces because your work seems tailor-made for the stage? Um, no, but I have some connection to theater and film. I um, made a lot of videos coming up and um, I worked as a costumer and dresser at the opera, you know, cause you dress them in the wings in between scenes in the opera, everybody comes out and you throw on these huge elaborate costumes, which is very exciting. Um, I, I have ideas for um, performative pieces that are more theatrical that involve set design and dance and, you know, a whole orchestrated spectacle that I would like to do. Um, and those big ideas, you need other people to work with. So as I'm developing those, I will let you know because it's something that's definitely on the horizon for sure. What did we say, Renee, um, in the future? Right. That's a <laughs> well, it's on the burner, it's burning. It's going yeah. It's, it's in development. Percolating. <laughs> Percolating. Yeah. Well, this Thank you for fun. that question. This has been fun. Well, there was another question. Do we have more questions or? There's one more. Oh, there you go. You have been very different. You have, you both, both have very different practices. In what ways do you feel your practices work overlap? Where do we overlap? I think in terms of uh, what we talked about earlier, um, the sort of uh, consciousness of the work and uh, the joy that can be derived from the work. Mm -hmm. um, As you're embodying different roles, when you're embodying different roles in the different bodies of work that you've made. Right. I mean, um, it's again, one of those questions. I mean, it's a kind of question that like, I, I would tend to agree with you. I mean, it's like, I mean, here's the deal, people. <laughs> yeah, tell this, us, break it down. Break these it down. questions are for like the critics, you know what I'm saying? And the people that, the academics, for me, that want to dissect the work. If I <laughs> sat and thought about any of those questions, in my studio, I probably wouldn't make a damn thing. Yeah. So I leave all those questions out. I do the work. I let the work come from, you know, here, the center, or as I've explained in the past, like from that place of no thought, right? Because, you know, constantly there's all this negative information coming in, pop, 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 like machine gun bullets. And when I'm able to clear out my mind through breath, mm -hmm. okay, then the creation, the creativity comes out and then it gets into the work. And to be perfectly honest, a lot of times I will start things. I have no idea what I'm doing, except that I'm right. doing it. And then right. when I finish, I look at the whole and to speak right. to something that you spoke about earlier, then I figure out, I will call it the marketing and packaging. Okay, as well, you said, no, yeah. in the beginning you said, okay, I couldn't talk about the spirituality, so I had to take it into consumer, consumerism and the reappropriation and the repurposing 
of the material the aspects and the formal aspects and of the work. That's the well, part so that's, that's, where, that's where we overlap. Huh? That's where that's where we overlap. Yeah. We we go for a sense of discovery in what we do and then and that's the we beauty. then we edit and yeah. we under we understand it and then we can share and describe the meaning. Because the joy that comes is it comes from you know you within me that is the the ability to be able to express that and also i will say the privilege i am yeah. super happy to be an artist i don't i don't know what else i could do but i'm really happy to be in that position and to perhaps share something or show people another way of being and another way of you know thinking about things and not just in the sort of prescribed linear manner that we are all sort of uh forced to ingest you know in terms of like the propaganda of just being in the society and the only thing i would say again my message to everybody out there is to just you know people free yourself do what you love do what you're passionate about. Don't force your children to become a bloody accountant, you know, if they don't want to. <laughs> Let them do what they feel is the best because whatever they do, they're going to do it with love and it's going to be better for the, yeah. the yeah. whole world. Right. And, and hey, I feel like I'm proof of that. Exactly. Um, steered me and supported me to where I am now. And I'm grateful too. And I'm really grateful that um, you invited me to chat with you about life and things. I feel like we could have gone another hour. For sure. Either we way. didn't even we didn't even get into like the, the dish that we were. I know, dishing. the nitty gritty. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you ladies. Wow. Thank you very much. Uh, Guild Hall it definitely appreciates your, your time. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>